Welcome to Discovering. It's here. The gun deer season starts on Wednesday. So in honor of that, I have a story from one of the most historic hunting camps here in the UP. Camp was built in 1896. The fact that it's still standing to me is almost a miracle. It's my favorite place in the world. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover. When you're a long time lover of Northern Michigan. For many, this week is the most wonderful time of the year. Men and women alike head to the woods for the time-honored tradition of deer camp. Some make the yearly pilgrimage from below the bridge or even further south, and for some youpers, it might only be a 20-minute drive to their favorite place in the world. Deer camp might be a one-room tar paper shack with no running water or electricity. Deer camp might be a three-bedroom lodge with all the modern comforts of home. Or deer camp might be somewhere in between. This year, I visited the guys at Camp Mouse. Ryan Tuntry. Mark Ketchum. Bill Scarf. Mike Tuntry. Camp Mouse is a small deer camp tucked in the woods and hollows north of Humboldt, where there's more moose than deer and more history than meets the eye. So this camp in particular is very historic. It was built in 1896, and the, the people that built this camp we're here logging the giant white pine of the UP, 20th century, turn of the 20th century. And then, however, it got into the hands of the Volker family. John Volker, his father, I believe, George Volker, picked up the rights to the property in the early 1900s, and I think the Volker family had it for 70 years. A quick UP history lesson for those unfamiliar with the Volker name. Born in 1903 and raised in Ishpeming, John D. Volker was a local lawyer, prosecutor, and a Michigan Supreme Court justice throughout his career. He was also a writer, penning books under the name Robert Traver. His most famous novel, which I'm sure you've heard of, is Anatomy of a Murder, which was based on an actual murder trial in which he served as the defense attorney. Published in 1958, the book was made into a movie in 1959 starring James Stewart and filmed right here in Ishpeming, Marquette, and Big Bay. Volker wrote many more books in his lifetime, mostly about fishing as he was an avid fly fisherman. He was just a cool guy. He's written some fun books. Anatomy of a Fisherman is just a picture book basically, but it has the Testament of a Fisherman poem in there, which uh, I used to be able to recite, but I can't anymore. <laughs> I fish because I love to. <laughs> there it is. Even though he owned a hunting camp, John Volker wasn't much of a hunter. His mission here was to uh, stock Volker's Creek, which is right behind us, with trout, and set up a place where he could actually fly cast, because you can't, it's just all brushed in. But my uncle and John 
transplanted trout up here at one time. There's a falls on Volkers Creek and they hike the fish up above the falls where it gets a little bit wider, but I don't think they ever really went back and checked on it. Our new hunting rifle. <laughs> The camp was given to my Uncle Hank by John Volker in 1973. And my uncle involved my brother and one of the other members of his deer hunting camp, which is south of Ishpeme. Really the only reason John gave it to my uncle is all of his partners had passed and John was never a deer hunter anyway, but the people that he had taken care of the place, never paid the lease. So U.S. Steel was actually gonna burn this down in 1973. When John offered it to my uncle, he, he really didn't want it, but he knew he had two nephews who would want it at some point. So they paid the back lease and we've been here ever since. I first started hunting up here in 1977. We were on strike from the mine. And um, there were four of us that cared a lot more about what was in the 12 pack than <laughs> what was in the woods. <laughs> and, and needless to say, we didn't shoot any deer for a few years up here, but um, we started getting more serious about it in the early 80s. And I, the first deer shot here was in 1983. And it's called Camp Mouse for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> the very first year that we deer hunted up here, there was an old wood cook stove in that corner and I opened the oven door when we were doing a cleanup and I couldn't even see into the oven for all the mouse nest material that was in there. And that first year we were right around 100 mice caught. <laughs> and the next few years, we put a real concerted effort into rechinking all the logs and we still get 30 or 40 <laughs> mice a year. We always say that the mice get it for nine months out of the year, and we try to take it back for three months from them. <laughs> Bill is my uncle. Started with my dad probably in the 70s or 80s, early 80s. Early 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, it just kind of evolved a little bit more. Uh, Bill has a son that lives in New Jersey who was also a member of the camp, couldn't be here. Um, he makes his annual trek in the middle of November like the rest of us. When we started, that addition was not on. We had to put that on, I think it was 93, because these guys started getting, the kids started getting pretty damn big. And <laughs> <laughs> with all the gear and stuff in here, that we just didn't have any room. Without the kids, we would, probably never put an addition on, would no, we? No, probably not. Because <laughs> it was such a cozy little camp. And it is a cozy camp. Once you get here and you get two days of heat in this building, this is as cozy as you can get. And myself, um, I'm a friend. I'm glad to have these guys as friends. They brought me up here. I started hunting up here in 2016. Comes and in February of 2018, I became a member of the camp. And uh, it's been a great, great experience. I love it up here. Guys are great. We all get along fine, and that's the most important thing. Absolutely.
Most people drive by this place and have no idea it's even here. And the fact that it's been here for over 120 years, it's very, very few people come down that little road and in, into the place. So it's kind of like a little hidden gem. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you get somewhere you can just get away. For years, cell phones didn't work here. Mm -hmm. We would always have to ride and make a call. And, you know, so when you get here, it's, it's kind of not the end of the world, but at times it feels like it. You know, there's no power, there's no water, there's, you're alone. And it's, it's just a great place to escape. And Lord knows we all need to escape. <laughs> so this is where we do it. There was no road in here until 1950. So the guys would park at the caretaker's camp on Silver Lake and walk in and they carried a sled and they would drop half of their provisions in a metal covered box that they called the coffin. Take in what they needed for a couple of days and then walk back out, get the rest of the supplies, come back in. And one of the guys who hunted with John Volker, name was Jack Seam. He would come up here for the full deer season and did not care if he got snowed in. He, d he just didn't care. And he was the woodsman of, of the camp from what we've gleaned out of the log books. I, I never knew the man, but he was able to get the whole deer season off. And one of our favorite en entries in the book, he was up here by himself and there was a reference to tune in to the, they left him a note in the coffin with four pints of beer to tune in to a certain radio station on when the next time they could come up and get him was. So he, there are no vehicle, he's here by himself, there are no gas lights, just wood heat. And another entry in there, <laughs> um, Butter supply gone. Butter late than never. <laughs> and we just, we cackle about that from time to time. In fact, Ryan will say that to me every now and then. <laughs> Same guy was featured in an article in the Milwaukee Sentinel or Journal where he found two bucks locked together and shot the one that was still alive and I, d I don't know what happened to those antlers but then he found another one in another year 25 inch inside spread and 14 points we know where that set of antlers is I, I haven't laid eyes on it but Ryan has but he was the hunter and like I said earlier, John was not much of a deer hunter, but he liked coming to camp. They had one other guy that never hunted. All he did was feed birds and cook and... The place had a lot of history. There were log books what? dating back to what, 19, 20... 40s. The 40s. To the 40s. 40s yeah. uh, very interesting to yeah. read. The way they talked about other people they would see while hunting, they called them jitterbugs. Red and black plaid. Jitterbug hunters. Um, so it's just it's just neat. You know, you come up every once in a while. You just dive into the books and you, know, you relive relive a little bit of that history. It's just kind of neat to be a part of it. I mentioned a little while ago. This is a deer camp grocery list from 1947. Full page, twenty seven dollars ten cents. We've come a long way from pig hawks and sauerkraut, but sardines. <laughs> Just all kinds of little treasures that were left from those that were here before us. And it's just, it's an honor to be able to carry it ahead. I think they would all be proud. Sunday, November 19th, 1944. What we want is silence and a mighty little of that. So... Far up in the north woods, away from all his friends, there camps the lonely trapper whose pleasure never ends. Winter after winter, we trappers go, over the trail, through the snow, rain, and hail. 
over the mountain and down to the brook, and there in the water an otter I took. That's the way a life of a trapper goes, half starved and nearly froze. J.M. Seam. So, when you're alone in the North Woods at night, the mind works and never quits working. <laughs> Especially when you're out of butter. This is my biggest buck story up here. I walk a lot when I hunt. Um, years ago I sat, but I can't. I don't have the patience to sit anymore, so I'm a walker. And I, I was w one day walking heavy snow, and I kind of skidded down a hill, and I got to the bottom in two beds. And I, I looked at it initially, I thought it was a doe and a fawn. But once I started looking, I realized it was a, a big buck and a doe. And I had jumped them. So I got on their tracks, and I followed them, and I caught them in the hardwoods at about 100 yards, and I had white patch in the scope, and his head was in a pine, and I didn't shoot. And I put the gun down, the deer turned and bounced, hands down, the biggest buck I've ever seen with a gun in my hand. But I didn't shoot, and I, to this day, that gives me a little bit of peace knowing that I did the right thing, that mm. is what I was taught. So. The blind had four open windows on all four sides of the blind, so my silhouette was easy to see if any movement occurred. And I looked out the left window and I thought, holy Moses, that's the biggest animal I've ever seen. And we called them yellow horns because his horns were, they weren't dark red or, or rust color, you know, like they get when they're rubbing, mm -hmm. but he was all yellow and big high rack. So. Naturally, buck fever set in big time, and I reached over to grab my rifle, and when I moved, he moved. And all I had for the shot was hindquarters and the spine, because there was a maple tree halfway between the blind and where he was standing, and it blocked out his whole front end. Hmm. So I had to decide, am I going to do it or not? And I said, nope, I'm not going to inflict a wound on an animal like that. So I let him go. We never saw him again. And Mark has a big buck story that involved muzzleloader season. <laughs> it was my first year up here, December of 16, and late in the evening, almost dark. Probably the biggest one I've ever seen come in. But it stood facing me, and I just didn't feel comfortable with it. And when it finally did turn, I did get a crack at it, but I ended up hitting a maple tree. <laughs> I bought a two-inch maple tree. That's where my slug was in that tree, and <laughs> off he went. And uh, probably missed my opportunity, and maybe never happen again. But at least I got to see one anyway. <laughs> and we've we've seen a lot of moose from the blinds. We we were talking last night. We've probably seen at least what thirty from camp. Lots, probably a lot more moose stories than we have deer stories, yes. to be honest. Yes. Um, I know for me in November of deer season of 2012, I had 29 moose sightings in 14 days. And I figured it was 10, 10 different animals, but I couldn't take a step in the woods without stepping on a moose. It was, <laughs> I didn't see 29 deer, I can tell you that for a fact, but I did see 29 moose. For sure, John would would be thrilled that the place is still standing and being used and to know he made the right decision giving it to my uncle. This place could have been lost without constant maintenance. When did we put the roof on, Mark? 2017. That's your job to talk about. <laughs> yeah, 20, 2017 in the main cabin here, we completely remove this entire roof in one day. It was off, back on, and probably almost half shingled in one day. Yeah. Um, we started on this side here, and we would just take off four four feet at a time, replace the boards, do the next four feet, because we didn't want to disturb the logs in the inside. And it come out perfect, as far as we're concerned, it come out perfect. Mm -hmm. It didn't change the integrity of the camp at all. It just it kind of kept the feel. It was, it was the same. It was boards going up the purlins and the fact that it's still standing to me is almost a miracle 
it's my favorite place in the world. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.